Hello, welcome all. Uh, welcome to this web interview organized by Transform Europe, a network of political foundations related with parties of the radical left in Europe. Uh, this web interview under the title The Left Reflects on the Global Pandemic uh, invites uh, Professor Gayatri Chakravotri Spivak. She will be interviewed by Monica Mokre a political scientist and also an activist in the fields of migration, asylum, and also imprisonment. You can find both their bios uh, on the chat box uh, here on your Zoom um, application. Um, the first part of uh, this interview will be a debate uh, between uh, Professor Spivak and Monica Mokre. And on the second half, you as the audience have the possibility to post questions to Professor Spivak using the Q&A box you can find here on the plaque tab of uh, your Zoom. Um, it is quite likely that we will not be able to take all the questions posed, so we highly encourage you to like, because th there is this option, questions by other participants that you do believe are quite critical. In this way, we can have a prioritization of the questions. Uh, I also have received some uh, questions by email, six or seven of them. Um, I believe that this um, interview would be extremely interesting and super stimulating. Listening to Professor Spiva would be um, amazing. We are so excited to have her here. Thank you also, Monica, for accepting our invitation. Um, I am now giving the floor to Professor Spiva. Thank you. Thank you, Angelina. I am genuinely honored that I've been asked to join this conversation. And I'm also quite delighted because I have been connected to Transform Europe now for some years. And uh, therefore, from a position of solidarity with them and a position of from within, as a kind of auto critique, I would say that in the web description, when we read, we, that is to say, uh, left scholars, intellectuals, politicians, are active day by day, driven by the needs of our communities, already reshaping the way we do politics. We are building solidarity, solidarity networks. The first question for me is who are the we because i believe that one of the problems with the left have been as a result in fact revolutions collapsed and this is something that they could not avoid because of pressure from the outside vanguardism and organizing this is structural they couldn't do anything else right after the bolshevik, bolshevik revolution there was the breast Litov's treaty and the new economic program. But I think the problem has been that we have taken motivation for granted and vanguardist, in a vanguardist way, organized. And I'm not alone in saying that we should pay more attention to our own position in terms of top down philanthropy and directives before we can say that we are reshaping the way we do politics. And I believe whatever I say today will reflect this feeling on my own part, because after all, I am also, I have been a leftist activist now since 1957. I can give you my records, but I don't think that's appropriate for this conversation. I want, in fact, also to say that in terms of uh, the United States, I would like to take a motto, which is not from the radical left, but from a West Point graduate who writes, citizens relinquish money and authority to governments first and foremost in exchange for protection from threats that they as individuals and communities cannot hope to confront by outspokenly rejecting this fundamental responsibility our federal government, he's writing, he's a West Point graduate, our federal government has clearly illustrated that America is a failed state 
one whose institutions no longer serve their intended purposes. This is not something that I have said, but I take this as a motto as a nearly 60 year resident of the United States. So I want to start by speaking about the Rohingyas. As we consider this phantasmagoria of biopolitics, let us start with the Rohingyas. According to the United Nations, they are the ethnic Muslim group that is a victim of genocide, at least since 2017, with rape used as a weapon by the majority ethnic Buddhist state and military of Myanmar or Burma. They have been in camps in Malaysia, which wants them to leave, although they have become leverage in party politics. And, the, and they have been in camps in Bangladesh. At the moment, because of coronavirus, the NGOs have left them. UNHCR has left them. And of course, they have no way of making themselves safe from anything. Here, at least, we can suggest a course of action for the international community. Work with a large international civil society organization bonded as they are with corporate funding to turn them around persistently so that they can be active with the Rohingyas again. I say to the unemployed PhDs at universities in the Euro US where I teach that this is a field where there is employment and work to do. The Rohingyas are often in wooden boats in the open sea where men live crammed below deck with only space to crouch, it's like the middle passage. Women and children are above deck, but all struggle for food, around half a cup of water on a good day, and a couple of mouthfuls of rice at 4 p.m. Refugees are beaten by the traffickers. People are reported as dying on these boats. Médecins Sans Frontières, which treated some survivors when they made it back to Bangladesh, including some children, said that most of the survivors couldn't stand or walk on their own when they reached the shores. Even before the virus, many among the Rohingya described their life as subhuman. And I have a, a, a slide from a Rohingya camp where a guy is saying in an incomprehensible Rohingya language, but this is what he's saying, that even a dog is treated properly when it dies, but not us, we are subhuman. Surya, if you will show it. Um, uh, now, uh, Monica, you asked me a very interesting question, which you sent me this morning, about the Rohingya, and I wondered if you would like to ask it now. Well, thanks. Of course I would, Gayatri. Um, so thank, uh, thank you for this insight, or the many insights. Um, and somehow I see my function as linking that, also the situation in Europe and also in Austria, um, and I read up a bit about the Rohingya after you, uh, I saw your presentation. And today I read that Malaysia has hindered a boat with 200 people to land due to the fear of the virus. And in Bangladesh, uh, these overcrowded refugee camps are locked down and recently arrived refugees are brought to a remote island. And this reminded me very much to the situation in Europe because I think it's structurally the same, not maybe in terms of brutality, but structurally. So we have, we have these camps in Greece and in Bosnia. We have the situation in the Mediterranean. We have boats which cannot enter Malta. But even here in, in, in Austria, uh, where it, the situation is better. It's a very rich country and there are not many refugees. But still, some days ago, I mean, for quite some weeks now, actually since the beginning of the crisis, activists said you have to bring these refugees to these central uh, lodgings. And this is not difficult, as I said before. It's a very rich country, not many refugees. This did not happen. Now in one of the big camps in Vienna, you have uh, over 20 infected people. So this was evacuated to another camp, one big hall for 400 people in Vienna. Um, and on the other hand, while we are speaking now, people are deported from Austria to Georgia, to Georgia and the Caucasus, obviously, um, in spite of the fact that borders should be closed, that it is said all the time, the primary aim is to save lives. 
Now, um, thinking about the situation and reading through the material you sent to us and sent to me, um, you referred there uh, to the Kant Kantian sublime, um, to the virus as a kind of, uh, that it could be understood as something like the Kantian sublime, which is threatening and uh, people and which is uh, uh, which uh, evokes fear, and that people, human beings, uh, can resist by their moral will against this virus, against the sublime. Uh, and so you wrote, the moral will should lead to the golden rule, treat others as you would like to be treated yourself. This does not emerge in the current context. We are no longer civilized in Kant's sense. So I would ask you to elaborate on that, on this lack of civilization, its causes, and maybe also on ways out of it. Wonderful, this is really a terrific question. And I do believe that we should try to make these kinds of structural connections, as long as we don't think they're exactly the same as you don't. This is very important. But I would also like to give here a, um, a, a difference, which is the Rohingyas are not migrants. They, in fact, Burma came to them rather than they to Burma because they have been in this area of the Arakans before they were called the Arakans, before nation state formations could give names to these kinds of groups. They are like genuinely like, uh, like indigenous communities without names in this area. So therefore, for them, they are stateless in a way that gives, makes me feel that they're a limit to my discourse. That's why I always put them on the threshold because this is not a situation of migrancy. And uh, so, Angelina, is there, are you telling me something? I can't hear you, you've muted yourself. Un unmute yourself. Excuse me, I just want to ask from Surya to unshare his screen because we still he's the, see the screen and not the speakers. Okay, so what you should do, Surya, is just show the Ai Weiwei thing and I'll make a comment on it and then you can take the screen away so that we see the speakers. Thank you, Angelina. Show the Ai Weiwei thing, if you can. Yes, there you are, show it. Okay, now this morning I received from, uh, from an art historian friend of mine this wonderful Instagram from the very well-known Chinese dissident artist Ai Weiwei. Again, this is a fantastic thing. But my question, as always, since I question the we, and I work, I work for subalterns now for 36 years, to make the subaltern accessible to what we call, quote, art, unquote, this they nobody nobody among the ungeneralized subaltern populations that are the largest sectors of the electorate in the tyrant led co uh, countries under which we suffer now they would not understand that this is quote art unquote and i am not interested in opening them to art right now this is very way back on my agenda so I just wanted to show this saying, I think this is a fantastic piece of work. And I'm quite sure you think so too. This is Ai Weiwei. But the difference, since that's what I will speak on, between ourselves as we wanting to create new politics and the world as it is, it is also reflected by this fantastic piece of work that I was sent yesterday. Thank you. And Surya, yes, take it up. Wonderful. So now I think what I will do is I will speak for my two hometowns. One of them is of course Calcutta, but behind me you see my favorite bridge in New York going to from JFK to Manhattan. This is the little drawbridge built in 1895 that I cross. Hardly anybody would think of it as part of my New York. So I put it there, it is also my hometown. But the, for speaking for my hometown in Calcutta, 
being safe, masked and gloved, and physically distanced against COVID-19 is there as here for the middle class. I want you to look at two pictures. The first one, sent to me by my sister who lives in Delhi, shows us that our hometown Calcutta, usually super crowded, is empty. So yeah, go for it. It's completely empty. These places are unbelievably crowded. This, by the way, is where my university is. And the second one, the second one sent to me by a rural high school teacher who wrote the words to the accompanying song shows the highways right outside of Calcutta as tremendously crowded. So the city is empty for the middle class and the highways which we don't notice are tremendously crowded with migrant laborers walking home hundreds of miles to die. Here are the two slides, and this relates to what Monica said about migrants, migrant laborers. They're not just in Europe. So let's look. Jomparon ki baliya tadir bari Aksho ki dusho otho ba shatsho maili And they're walking the, these miles because they feel that it's better to walk home and die than to remain uh, unprotected in this town which will not accept them anymore. So this is class, but also politics. I want to show, uh, why am I doing this? Because quite often Europeans will look at India as a kind of monolith. I mean, I've lived in the United States teaching at a very well-known university for nearly 60 years, 56 years teaching, four years as a graduate student, but I'm still sold as a quote Indian, unquote. So there is a certain kind of monolithic uh, um, statement toward the global South. And I'm asking as, someone from Calcutta not to do it to my, my, uh, my collaborators on Transform Europe. So it's also politics. I will show a so-called quote, rural video. In order to have solidarity, one must try to earn the right to understand this kind of stuff. Here is a quote, rural video put forward by the ruling party, which my sister sent me. So show the thing. There is a, a long, uh, take it off, take it off. 
uh, th there is a long uh, uh, exchange with my sister, which I'm not going to read because obviously we don't have the time, but I'm only going to read the first comment I made to her. My sister lives in Delhi. She sent me this. And I wrote to her, this is reminiscent of Trump. Not a word about cleanliness or distance, just standing close together, singing from a written script. The government woman has adjust, has, is doing her, just doing my job expression. She's the one who's sitting down. The song says protest is stupid and the government will give you money. I don't play the whole song. Sung on behalf of the BJP Panchayat in Chandipur block, East Mednipur. How many villagers do you think are taken in by this? So in other words, they're not dumb. This is part of party politics. How many villagers do you think? I mean, I work in the villages. I know very well that they would recognize this for what it is. How many villagers do you think are taken in by this? I write to my sister. Sorry to be so critical, but I know the violence behind this kind of propaganda so very well at home, that is to say, so personally. There's so much killing going on. And so she, I won't write, read everything, she writes, why should, you th should I think you were scolding me? I sent it to you to give you some idea how things could be. Things in North in Indian cities are very different. And then she writes about the migrants herself, but I don't have the time to read that. Now, the, um, so the, when, we have to, uh, when we have to talk about the sublime here, and Monica, I'm so glad you asked me that question because you know, I am learning, which is why I was so delighted to get this invitation. I'm learning as I'm thinking of how to speak to my European sisters, as I call you all. And I realized last night that it is actually a failure of the sublime because the sublime suggests that we find our solution because this is a huge thing, a natural thing, the sublime is always natural and the, it frightens us. It's so big, it's bigger than humanity. But then by subreption, the moral will kicks in and so we are able to control it. But in fact, what I want to say is that it is a failure of the sublime and in fact, it relates to the unbelievable release of humanism as a result of this COVID-19 um, outbreak. I mean, for before that, there was a certain kind of feeling that humanism was not so good because we have to be post-humanists, we have to think about animals and so on and so forth. But now what has happened is we can, as a result of this, give a certain kind of expression to a kind of unrelieved humanism. Now, why? And this is my, my thought on this. There is no medicine here. So therefore, what we are doing is human behavior is the medicine. You see, because we have, don't, don't have medicine, human behavior is the medicine. This is getting, and so therefore, the middle class has, has transformed this into a kind of sentimental humanism. And what it's bringing in is family values. You know, there's so much talk about family values, which had kind of taken a bit of a backseat before, but now no longer, which this is completely possible. That we are bringing in petty bourgeois ideology, like every small business has become the, I mean, jobs are being talking about, talked about constantly. You know, this morning I saw about school children's jobs being undone. And so therefore, it seems to me that what we are watching here is, now why do I like the Kanchen sublime, etc.? It's because you, this European enlightenment is the only thing that remains for us for the uh, affirm, what I call affirmative sabotage. They had a long time to develop a lot of things because there was uh, a long time between the development of capital and its slow uh, march. Whereas today, with digital idealism, most of our humanist middle-class uh, middle uh, um, cohorts, they are interested in having speed solve everything. So therefore, that's why I do talk about Kant, etc. But I just want to emphasize that there is no 
uh, the, what I have learned thinking about it is that we are actually witnessing the um, witnessing the witnessing the uh, defeat of that idea because it is a humanist idea. So that's my answer to your question about the Rohingyas, that they are not only not migrants, but Burma came to them. You know, I mean, and uh, the other thing is so that they're stateless in a way that I can't understand. And the other one is that it, it is indeed a failure on, I mean, the moral will has nothing to do with it. It's in fact, because we have become so unbelievably humanistic as a result of the fact that it's the medicine is human behavior and the middle class therefore can come forth and talk about its own family values and so on and so forth and petty bourgeois ideal ideology of everything getting capitalized i think that's why that's why i realize that it is not a question of the sublime but a failure of the sublime so i think uh, what I should do is go on to the next slide, the, um, which was, I mean, I'm not as well organized I should be, but let me tell you that this is not a new thing. Okay, so the, um, I'm not reading any of the other stuff, so I will, the next slide shows us something, I'll say, manufactured for the upper middle class. It's classical music with English subtitles. It talks about cleaning. It's a completely different kind of thing from the two that we've seen before. Good I guess what I'm trying to say here is that we should not, uh, we should not, in fact, um, monolithize, um, monolithize India or anything in the global south. But if we want to do it, I then I would like to. Th this is the next one, isn't it? I would like to um, like to cite a a video put together by my friend Mitushin, who's a Bengali, she's not actually speaking any language on this one, so that you can follow her 10 points so that you can, in fact, monolithize us. Okay, well, at, uh, after this, I think, uh, you know, I should like to tell you that many, many people are rightly concerned. They email about how terribly my rural schools must be 
uh, must be faring. Even as they know that in their own countries, people who can afford it are removing themselves to rural areas to escape the virus. And in the caste ridden rural areas, I try, I mean, there's, the caste system exists among the subalterns, believe me. I try to make the ones I work with think about the migrant laborers as much less fortunate than they, because of course, in the rural area where I work, they don't know anything about migrant laborers. They're way below the NGO radar. I've never seen an NGO in 36 years. So therefore, in order, since they vote and democracy is other people, I have to tell them, the, uh, even as I give them food and this and that, think about the migrant laborers because there are locals who are actually joining to do something for them. Anyway, so that's, that's, the, um, that's the next, uh, point that I would make in order to uh, go on explaining the, um, uh, the, um, the, the slideshow, I think I would say that the idea of, uh, of uh, my, since I do not make, that's the next one, right, Surya, you have to help me here. Since yes. I, I do not make this work with the subalterns public, I mean, it's not a secret. But if I put a web page, then all of the top-down philanthropists will come in and ruin my work with just loving these people and giving them computers, etc. So it's not, uh, uh, there's no web information. And therefore, there is a great deal of hostility that is generated for me and against me by the Indian uh, Bengali uh, middle class because they see me as an elite uh, US person although the uh, Euro US sees me as a visible minority, it's a sad thing. And they send me memes. I get many, many. And since I don't want to waste your time, I just want to show you two. The first one takes a photograph of me at 31 with Derrida and creates it. And the second one, it takes a photograph of me from acceptance of the Kyoto Prize in 2012. And in fact, because my luggage didn't arrive, I'm just putting, I've put my sister's clothes on top and inside I'm wearing what I wore in the airport. But nonetheless, I look like, you know, I'm very wonderfully dressed. So they take that one and they create these memes, two memes. So this is my explanation of the of the um, uh, of the thing. Should I show the animal ones right now and then do with it, uh, get done with the uh, with the uh, what you call it? What do you think, Angelina? See, be, because what I'm trying to say about the animals is that the because of this unrestrained humanism, the animal world can no longer be anthropomorphized and patronized, so that. Post-humanism has taken a back seat and this digital idealism and family values allows unrestrained play because there is no post-humanism and animals cannot be treated in this way. All we have fallen back on is the celebration of basic liberal petit bourgeois ideology. So let's just show those two short animal videos and be done with it. The animals are coming in and the men are running. It's not, we can't anthropomorphize and patronize them anymore. I actually lectured here. What the hell uh, animal was that? And this one is a guy who's actually coming to supply milk. You see all that white stuff? But he's so scared, he leaves his milk and runs, and the an elephant is contemplating the milk. See, so I just wanted to show these three so that all our kind of really self serving post humanism, which was just anthropomorphizing and patronizing. It can, now the animals, in fact, will not allow us to do that. And so we are back into the kind of humanism that is allowed. So I think 
at this point, I would ask, um, I would say that I'd rather hear Monica ask me the wonderful new questions that she sent me. Well, thank you, Gayatla. I think I could now ask another 10 questions, but then Angelina will kill us, I think. I know. Um, I don't want to be asked. <laughs> no, no, so I will, yeah, yeah. So I will go along as I did in writing to you. Um, I mean, what you described uh, very clearly and, and, and uh, also in images is how the virus and also the like the protection against the virus is affecting different classes in different ways in India. And also you mentioned, which I think really interesting, this petty bourgeois reaction, but I, I will skip that for now. I think it's, it's super, super interesting uh, how this works, because I see the same thing here and even artists, you know, they start up now writing their Corona diaries, saying how nice it is to sit in your house in the countryside and we should do that more and we should not all the time be in contact. and. Uh, not thinking about people who are like 10 people in two rooms or something like that. So obviously, again, it's a similar thing here in Europe and in Austria. It's also class specific. It's not as brutal as what you described, but still. I mean, I'm, I'm one of the privileged. I'm working from home. I'm getting my salary. Everything is fine. Um, we have the highest unemployment rate since the Second World War. This will be, I mean, and this will hold. And we have the people who go to work in hospitals and in supermarkets um, who are now called systemically relevant. Um, in other times, these are called uh, menial jobs, jobs without any cultural capital and also without a lot of, of salary. So this in itself, I think, is interesting. And so I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit on the, on the question of class, of the impact of class nowadays, maybe even class struggle obviously in the intertwining with, with race and gender. I mean, most people I was talking about in the systematically relevant sectors who are badly paid are migrant women. Um, yeah, and I was also wondering, but maybe this is leading us too far about uh, use value and exchange value so that you can see where you can see now this, this kind of friction, but yeah, maybe this is too much. So we, maybe you can answer to some of those ideas. Yes, and again, you know, I am in, uh, I'm in sympathy with you because, of course, what I'm describing when I'm talking about the petty bourgeois stuff is my other hometown, New York. So, you know, there is a similarity between mm -hmm. your, your experience in Austria and my experience in the United States. And the United States is a bigger example of this failure because of Trump also, but also because of what the United States resembles, I mean, Trump is a symptom. But at any rate, I, so f from out of this solidarity, I will say that the, I think uh, the, uh, the, at this point, it is not really class, although class struggle is more important in the area where I work at home in, the, mm -hmm. in India. Uh, class is not the biggest point because labor given finance capital you know finance capital and my my numbers will be wrong because these are from last month and it, they increase it goes around 75 times more than world trade so to so therefore given finance capital given cloud economies given the fact that a lot of money is not even what kant would call verwirklicht you know realized is a bad uh, the English translation, although mutamo, it's okay. So uh, therefore, and given the fact that certainly uh, in the United States, managerial labor has become completely the big things are in fact taken over by management in many ways. So, and their permanent casuals are women and so on and so forth. The reason why, therefore what the, the labor therefore is not the primum mobile of exploitation anymore. Both development, unquote, is. And to an extent, what we need there, and I've written about this, and I will say that dissidents in the former Soviet Union picked this up and translated it. Well, the real issue now, as we see also in India, is citizenship, mm -hmm. rather than it's the, it's the citizenship really examined in a very, very careful way. 
So therefore, you know, as an Indian citizen, for example, I have, I am my own field work here to see the, the way in which the fact of my institutional power in the United States, in the Euro US, the institution of the university, the fact that the only place where I own, it's a, uh, it's a apartment where I'm sitting in the uh, working class district of Washington Heights, which is getting gentrified, but nonetheless, I own property. The only place where I have checking accounts, etc., or any kind of bank account is the United States, but it doesn't matter. Citizenship undoes it all. So to an extent, I'm, I'm my field work. So the, I'm sure if I had children, I wouldn't uh, remain uh, an Indian citizen, but, I'm, uh, but fortunately I'm free. So to that extent, I think today, the real, uh, real uh, uh, the, the agent of the possibility of social justice is the citizen, and that's where we work. So therefore, class to an extent is not accessible to us in the way that it was, uh, that it was. I'm not against class struggle. As I say, half of my work, which is in India, I have two teaching jobs, one at Columbia, where I have a salary, and the other in India, where I repay my ancestral debts, because I'm a caste Hindu and I ruined the people, my ancestors ruined the people, no personal guilt, but historical responsibility, ruined the people for millennia. Colonialism was just yesterday. So to an extent, that's the, in, in that area, class struggle is certainly important. I'm not against class struggle, but it seems to me that the main focus, we cannot any longer. And so what happens when we try to create class solidarity? We saw this in Genoa. Outsourcing kills it. You know, my, uh, my friend uh, Anunna, in fact, was trying to create uh, this guy. She's, very, she's an activist too. And I asked her, what happened? Why isn't it working? And she said, well, because of outsourcing, there is a real division within an international division, within mm -hmm. national division of labor. So therefore, class uh, solidarity has become a little, uh, little, um, a little, um, you know, not really impossible, but it's not, it's not um, going to be um, the main uh, movement in the world internationally against the abstraction of global capital and finance capital. And I would also say that in terms of the essential workers who are in fact racialized and gendered, just as you mentioned, I completely agree, but I do not believe that this particular, this particular sense of who is essential for us is going to remain in place. Mm -hmm. we, mm -hmm. I don't believe, I mean, now it is. And I want here to cite someone called David Rodiger who wrote a fantastic book on Du Bois. I, I learned a lot, a lot from Du Bois. I've been working on Du Bois for some time. I can see the limits there too, but nonetheless, there's a lot to learn. So at any rate, David Rodriguez has a, has a, Rodriguez, sorry, has a concept called revolutionary time. And this we know, you and I both, from our experience, that when we are actually within a struggle, a gesture politics struggle, as the middle class is thinking of this as a real hu humanist struggle, during that time, we really do a great many things and in a very little time, quality is wonderful, real solidarity. But in fact, when Gramsci and Fanon knew this too, when that particular thing is solved one way or the other, we in fact do not have that kind of energy anymore. This is, this is decades of experience. Like Du Bois, I say, that if I use my experience, I apologize because it's got to be distorted, but I don't have anything else. So therefore I would say that they're not going to remain socially recognized as the important, perhaps places where there is some kind of socialist government already in place or there's a party of them, perhaps something. But here my feeling is, if I may say this, this is going to make everyone angry. I'm going to, but believe me, I think I know what I'm talking about. 
I think the best one can hope for is to borrow from the right and say that there will be a trickle down effect. So there will be. <laughs> because there is a trickle down effect. But I, this was a hard one. <laughs> for me too, that's why I'm laughing. I would rather weep. And you see, we are discovering in the United States that even the New Deal was racialized. You know, this is a, I mean, we have to be practical and serious rather than only enthusiastic because of the, the advantages that this situation gives. And as for, I mean, as you know, I'm not going to, you were right in saying that this is not a time, it would be an interesting discussion about use value and exchange value. But I will say that there is, there are some situations of barter here. But mm -hmm. you, you will see that the bartering that's being made, at least I'm now speaking about New York, the, uh, the bartering that is being made so, which is not really exchange value or use value, the bartering that's being made so vivid so that we all say, oh, how wonderful, aren't we great Americans, aren't we great New Yorkers, and so on. I love New York, that's not the problem. But the thing is, you know, this kind of nationalism, patriotism, New York is the capital of the worldism, about which I used to joke with my friend Edward Said. But they, the, these barters are in fact getting capitalized. They are getting uh, enormous amounts of funds. And they, then they're being congratulated for not enormous amounts like the corporate sector, don't get me wrong, but they are getting funded by people who are very uh, top-down philanthropists who really like this kind of stuff. As I say, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a field day for humanists, even as the migrants and the blacks and the uh, Latino exes, they are in fact being at the same time uh, oppressed, their lives don't matter, just as you say. Nonetheless, these barterings are being congratulated when they become this petit bourgeois, small businesses. Small businesses are the hero. So that's how, that's how I would go for this one. That's a fantastic question. Thank you, Dadria. Yeah. I try to keep a bit track of time because I think uh, at least at eight we have to open up for questions, maybe a bit earlier. But there's one question that's really very close to my heart, and at least this one I would like an answer, still an answer. Many questions, as I said before. You mentioned solidarity, you also mentioned this well, form of humanism, which is kind of humanitarian help and whatever, top down, and the problems of that. And this is something which is kind of uh, which is a problem, which I've been pondering for a long time now, uh, working with uh, asylum seekers, with migrants, with refugees. So somehow, do you see a possibility of solidarity, of working together on eye level under the context of radically and obscenely different privileges, which is what is happening in these situations? Do you see that and if yes, well, how and in which ways can one frame that and somehow maybe i'm wrong here but i think for me it also goes together with your focus on citizenship and on yeah legal rights structures systemic rights so rather than i don't know individual suffering or something like that but anyway i wanted to ask a question not to, <laughs> not to again a very important question where i am not only with you but i congratulate the desire, unless we have this desire of creating a situation where it will be possible to, as you say, eye level solidarities, unless we keep this desire alive, even as we know as activists, what an incredible amount of work will have to be done in order for this to become possible, perhaps not in our lifetime, and opened again because every generation is born un, uh, untrained into this kind of denial of the basic human affect of greed, which leads to capitalism, and then fear and violence. We know these things. As an educator, I certainly know these things. But, you know, the, the, the idea that we can 
that this can happen it must be kept alive in our minds. So I'm with you there. But I would say that, you know, in order for me to have solidarity with you, look how much I have put in. I read in your languages. I can teach you in your, you, I'm a Bengali middle class girl. There were no foreign language departments at the University of Calcutta when I was a graduate student. So I had all the French I had was one semester of French at the Alliance Francaise, the Centre Culturel in Calcutta, because it was, a, it was at least a capital city. So how much have I done in order to be, but still, of course, sold as an Indian. But how much have I done in order to mm -hmm. come forward and earn solidarity? So, and I will also say this, that the migrants do better than these we, the you know upper class, upper middle class uh, people in creating. I, I'll tell you a story. There is a novel by Peter Dickinson, who's just you know a British counterintelligence went to Eton and so on. But we don't need. I mean, if we are Marxists, we don't believe that it's personal intention only. It's ideology also. This guy wrote a book which I would teach in my ethics class called Poison Oracle, where the chimpanzee solves the problem, which is very easy, just a rational problem. But so you, you can do it with a primate. You don't even need a so-called human being. And then the anthropologist, you see what happens when uh, uh, someone like us begins to earn that right, learning languages, this, that. They become anthropological and reverent towards, at least I'm not reverent towards Europe anymore. It's been a long time. But nonetheless, they become reverent. And so in this book, the anthropologists are like unbelievable about the language, etc. But the migrant, a, a girl from that, and, uh, that community stows away on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a plane. She has learned very quickly the formula which is going to explain Europe to her. And she's doing it in her local cultural way. She begins to sing. And what is her song? Cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect, <laughs> cause and effect. Okay? In a Cockney uh, thing, Cockney accent, because that's the only accent she has heard. So the thing is, you will see that generally speaking, the uh, migrants do a better job of actually uh, uh, earning the right to enter because their life depends on it. But even there, of course, greed operates unless there is teaching. Greed is across the board, not just the capitalists. So to an extent, I would say that, you know, I mean, uh, this humanism that I'm talking about, I regularly visited Africa. It was, I, have, I th do things in Africa, but uh, the, it, during Ebola, they were not, not because I was a, a heroic person, but they were doing a much better job of containing it. You know, even in small places like Abuja, for example, before the Chinese built the airport. I was in Ghana while there was Ebola in another section of the city. They, because they were looking at it as an epidemic pandemic rather than some kind of uh, festival. And they were not, there were no nationalism there because Africa, unfortunately, is used to accepting aid. They're told they should. So they took, they themselves worked, but they also took uh, help from other countries for the solution, etc. I was there all the time. I mean, my family would say, my God, you're going, I said, look, I won't die because there are people in the area where I am. It's not going to happen. And today I read the, this kind of, not yesterday, there was a central Africa, there was a kind of COVID action platform. And they have not, Dr. Daryl Bricker, Dr. Tom Frieden, they were, they're all sort of um, infectious disease and public health uh, physician, World Health Organization, regional director for Africa, etc. They have not understood Africa. They are trying to apply. I'm not saying Africa is wonderful, but I'm saying that in this particular matter, they are much more practical because they take an epidemic as an epidemic. And so the, what happens, is, and so they have uh, created a kind of uh, document which applies our standards, the ones that you and I share, that they have tried to tell us 
about Africa's problems. I mean, Africa certainly has problems. My, uh, my, uh, I hope, in fact, Oluwaseun is watching this. My uh, uh, friend and um, intern, uh, young man, um, Oluwaseun Akinfenwa, he was somehow, you know, we all kind of put in money, etc. He was somehow able to get on a plane uh, to go back to, uh, to a, a lot of money, to go back to Africa day after tomorrow because uh, all the airspace is closed. So it's not like Africa, and he'll have to be three weeks quarantined in a hospital space, small city he lives in, Ilorin. But the thing is that this particular thing, I'm not, I do not admire and uh, uh, fall over for any nation state in the world, including the Republic of India, which I love in a certain way because I'm a citizen, but love is not political. It's, pre-political, I can't help it. And including the Republic, including the, the United States where I have thousands of American students whom, to, with whom, whom I've tried to teach as much as I can the difference between right and wrong so that I feel like I also vote here because they vote. But nonetheless, <laughs> I'm, I'm not critical of, uh, I'm not, I don't love the United States. But it, I don't love, love nation states, named nation states, especially since globalization, which is digital and abstract, it has in fact tried to, uh, to, uh, to propagate the, um, uh, the idea of identitarianism so that all of this is forgotten. But nonetheless, I will say that this particular thing in Africa, we should be able to acknowledge rather than impose our own standards on them to show that they can't quite match up and they will be in a terrible space. Maybe they will, I'm not a predictor, but this is just this moment. Well, Gayatri, thank you so much. I said before I could go on for hours, I should not. I think we should show solidarity with the people who are listening and maybe want to ask questions. Angelina, will you take over now? Microphone, uh, Angelina, microphone, unmute yes. yourself. You're perfect, Monica, because I was about to show you a small text with the time, so you're great. I, okay, I will start taking some questions from the audience. Um, I will start. Remember, the Surya was going yes, to discuss. But, but first of all, yes, I will give the floor to Surya. Uh, he will be a great discussant, and I think he, he can pave the floor for the questions. Surya, please. Thank and you. please also introduce yourself. Okay. Uh, I'm Surya Parekh, Assistant Professor of English at Binghamton University. Uh, I have three related questions for you, Gaitidi. You shared some thoughts with me this morning, and also going from some of the emails that you shared with the panel. The Three things I want to ask you about is one of the things you spoke about in one of your emails was about the persistent containment and redirection of food. And I wonder if you would expand on that, especially the idea of persistence here. The second is I wonder if you would say a little bit more about affirmative sabotage and uh, European civilization. And one of the things you had shared with me is that when you're speaking about the Kantian sublime, it's also a critique of the sublime that relies on humanism. And the third thing related to that is I wonder if you'd say a little bit more about the unrestrained play between digital idealism and family values. Okay. The, um, I think, Surya, I won't take the Kant because I believe I already said something. And I think the i will the one that i will really talk about is digital idealism the digital idealism as i have said to this is a very important point to make before we begin it's a wonderful thing digital idealism but digital idealism as i have said many many times depends on folks the good use of digital, digital idealism depends on folks who already have the benefit of a liberal education. Otherwise, it's venting. I said this to the World Economic Forum when I was on their ethics committee, which had to be disbanded rather quickly because of this, because we couldn't fit into knowledge management. 
In that blog, I said that you will never get a moral matrix out of knowledge management, which is at least a little better than digital idealism. I said that the, the soul must be slow cooked first, then we produce someone who can use the incredible power of the digital world. Otherwise, you get cyber crimes, you're constantly having to make more and more restraints, etc. And I will say that again here, that the digital idealism that thinks that these are real connections, it forgets that the ones like in Tian Tiananmen Square, they could do it because they were already, they were already inspired to do this. And so the use of digital idealism, the, the digital idealism is not a good idea. We should use the digital when we have been, we have helped in the slow training and that just as physical athletics cannot be done long, remote distance, in the same way, mental athletics cannot be done in that remote way. So I, that slow cooking of the soul, and I use that word soul, I, I'm an atheist, but I use that word, is absolutely necessary so that the, uh, the powerful and dangerous thing, which is the cyberspace, can be used. And so that's how I would answer your question about unrestrained digital idealism and confidence in it. I mean, today is the day of the Piketty's who don't even talk about capital formation, who don't even talk about class, or uh, uh, Negri and Hart, who are my friends. Tony Negri is a dear friend, almost uh, comparable in age, but nonetheless, they have these prepackaged multitudes. Today is the day for these folks. Today is not the day, not only for class struggle, but even for the fact that the subaltern is ungeneralizable. How many people are there in the world to whom this kind of digital idealism is not available at all, number one. And the other, the persistence uh, thing, I think I said because it's not, it's not, I mean, I said that if we want to in fact involve the uh, people who are below us, the first, first requirement is redistribution. And this redistribution to, to convince nation states, and this uh, Monica also agrees with me, to convince states and policymakers and development workers, that lobby, to uh, do a redistribution so that there can be some kind of solidarity is almost impossible. It's very easy to say that, you know, precarity can be solved this way or that way. But the real question is, and Anthony Appiah said this very nicely supporting me because I had said at one point, the point is not who's speaking. The point is who's going to listen to you. <laughs> That's something that we should remember when it comes to the question of redistribution and persistence. And the um, affirmative sabotage thing, I think I did already um, answer somewhat. I don't think I should take more time. But thank you for starting off the discussion so that now we can take. I should also thank Surya for unbelievable help. This morning when I was actually getting these ideas, I was talking to him while I was doing some other tasks that I have to do in terms of the Du Bois Library in Accra, which the less said about it, the better. And so I was doing that task. I was saying, Surya, and, and I was saying to Anne, listen, I'm talking to two people. Surya, write this down, write this down. So that the thoughts that were coming, so he, he and I worked together in a way that, and I, I kept saying, please, excuse me. He says, don't excuse me. Don't excuse yourself, I'm learning. And I said, look, Surya, I am learning too, which is why I accept these kinds of invitations. But now let's open the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Spivak. Okay, uh, we will now proceed with the questions from the participants. The first question, do you think that the COVID-19 has given space for us to think about nature, which seems that regains its lost beauty and the animals have regained somehow a freedom to move inside this world? 
on this uh, time of the pandemic? If so, after we regaining our routine life, will we continue thinking about nature and animal life? How many should we take uh, together? Maybe three? Give okay, me yes, Give me yes, three okay, okay. Do you think that the pandemic um, is taken as an excuse by various countries worldwide to suppress minorities, loot money from um, the public, and impose also their sinister agendas? And the third one, um, the most important question is um, that the international labor faces today is of its very existence in another future world order. The fourth international revolution of ICT, robotics and biotechnology had already altered the modes of production and consumption and had beleaguered labor very, very badly. So in such a critical situation, what possible turn is the global economy going to take and what will it mean for the future of labor? Okay, the uh, COVID-19 and nature. See, that's why I showed those animal uh, slides that, you know, they're not, they can't be, uh, they can't be uh, patronized right now by us. And so, number one. But I will say this, that, you know, the ones who already love nature, like you, the questioner, and me, I, I, I'm a city girl, so I've learned to love nature in a kind of, different way but nonetheless uh, because i work uh, because marx says that the capitalization of agriculture to into agribusiness is primitive accumulation you don't even need industry right then so therefore i have a feeling now and so i think those of us who already love nature will continue to love it and remember you know everything becomes memory do you uh, I really like your question. Do you see how many people talk? I, I don't know if you're in the United States, but certainly in the United States, many, many people talk about, we remember my grandparents. I now remember how my grandparents talked about the Great Depression. Yeah. And so I, we think, and how they talked about the, uh, the plague and, you know, the, uh, and I remember uh, you, as I was growing up, the huge famine and the uh, Mahamari, you know, the, um, what is it? I mean, I think of it in Bengali, right? It's, it's also a pandemic, okay? So those kinds of things, I grew up in a cholera infested time. So those kinds of things, those of us uh, who remember, you see, this kind of thing turns into memory very soon. So that you and I will remember how the skies were clear and how nature could be appreciated. And maybe before the world returns to quote normal, unquote, in other words, uh, capitalism with a little trick down, the, uh, before uh, that, maybe we will be able to persuade a few people. Gramsci thought that the new intellectual should be a permanent persuader. And you can see from the way I, I'm kind of putting my life into what I'm saying, I try at least to follow that. So maybe we will be able to persuade some people, but my friend, my feeling is that it will not last. Okay, that's one thing. As for the uh, a way this taking advantage of uh, the pandemic in order to forget other kinds of things that minorities want, my short answer is yes. And, but the long answer is also not very long. Don't, don't be afraid, Angelina. Um, uh, but the longish answer is, as I was saying, and as indeed um, uh, Monica was also suggesting, even as we are doing this kind of, you know, putting them, quote, in their place, unquote, we are also, we, the philanthropic, top-down, uh, uh, middle-class, um, enjoying our solidarities within this, we are trying to present ourselves as real benefactors. And some of it is happening, but you know, uh, the, some of it is happening. How long it, it will happen, I don't know. I happen to live in a city where the mayor has some socialist instincts. And 
the governor is has some liberal instincts so to an extent that's it's a little different new york is not like the rest of the rest of the united states so but nonetheless i would say that they are also they're being exploited in different ways you know because they can really be a proof of how good we are not just how bad we are behind uh, everybody's back so yes i agree with that as for the third question i cannot really answer that question in any responsible way as to what kind of uh, what kind of direction labor will take i because my own uh, as a humanities teacher my own feeling is although i'm not against this you must understand i'm just talking about what i can do my own feeling is that descriptive analyses that are correct it's not enough for the left to produce them and so to an extent i also don't have the wherewithal to produce them but nonetheless i think that we have indeed come into what you call a new mode of production but given the fact that uh, actual uh, physical production you see the phenomenology of capital which is what uh, marx was haunted by hegel so to an extent his critique of hegel was that it was only about the mind and he was correct his phenomenology of the mind so to an extent the uh, as to what happens with that old old um, old uh, phrase mode of production of value the value form is no longer what it used to be we remember marx was capable more than capable very brilliant man indeed of thinking that the value form is not forever how much he wrote in praise of aristotle but he said he was after all a classical um, uh, phd the classical greek but nonetheless he said aristotle could not think the value form because in his uh, conjuncture there was no possibility of the value form as that abstract unit contentless unit of measure and today the value form has changed to data and so it's not in fact the general equivalent is not money so therefore the idea as it is money is not capital so therefore within the context where the value form is data and just as money was money's phenom phenomenal identity was taken away from it when it became the general equivalent in the same way the fact that data is actually uh, uh, actually life material uh, work material that is forgotten so to an extent that th this thinking the thinking of what is going to happen to labor as such is a thinking that cannot be thought like a marxist fundamentalist marx and engels in their 1872 uh, edition uh, introduction to the communist manifesto wrote and this is completely available it's not esoteric they wrote forget the sections on revolution because big business has gone too far in the last 25 years they're fair out it those sections but we are not making a change because this is now a historical icon this is what they wrote you can go back and look and or perhaps you know already so therefore we have to think our own thinking we cannot do it in terms of that vocabulary remember i'm coming from a state west bengal which had a left government until they just bit the dust rather recently so therefore I, even as i'm completely in uh, sympathy with you and even as i acknowledge that i do not have enough uh, knowledge to be able to really give a good prediction you should ask david harvey and uh, at the same time i would say that for me the challenge of thinking remember what marx said about the content of the 19th century revolutions and i quote poetry of the future poetry of the future and this way of descriptive analysis using a vocabulary that would be like aristotle's today not paying attention to marx and engels's warning in the 1872 introduction for me is no longer possible i hope i haven't been too 
uh, terrible and you won't say, ah, that is Vivek, not a communist, you're just a liberal. This is what people say about me. Perhaps I am. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, we proceed um, with three more questions. Um, so, uh, the first one, elites and the governments promise um, a return to normality, meaning the global capitalism. That is the problem for us. Shouldn't the left um, come out of this defensive uh, strategy that it seems uh, we follow and try to impose a strategic emancipatory plan? Isn't this, uh, isn't now the time? Is okay. the first one, the second, um, yeah, should the governments um, impose stricter punishment for the people who are not complying with the pandemic management measures? Initially, um, Professor Spivak, when I saw this question, I was a bit puzzled, but I actually do believe that it has a meaning. Um, I don't know in general about other countries, but I come from Greece, I live in Athens, and within the left, um, there were dozens of attitudes and views upon how actually do we stand towards the pandemic, uh, the restriction measures of the government, what do we do with our everyday politics, so that means that we stop doing politics, and there were many contradictions upon that, and I do believe that there still are, for example with the demonstration of the 1st of May there were many discussions, so I do believe that such a question and questions may be similar to that are quite relevant. Um, and the third one is, um, okay, who according to your view is the subaltern in the age of the global pandemic? <laughs> global pandemic, okay. Uh, all right, these are, good, these are good questions. These are fantastic questions. I, you know, it's a little bit like an oral exam. So you will tell me whether I get a B minus or, or above. Okay, I, I'm trying my best. They're all really questions that put my head to task. Okay, the first one is yes, yes, absolutely. But the problem is because of populism, because of a, a populism in most of the nation states with which I am myself acquainted, it is very difficult to say that the left should plan a strategy. There is a lot, an emancipatory plan. This putting of, a putting of, it is a humanist statement, but it's, it's a good statement because humanism is both medicine and poison. You have to know how to use it. It's not just poison. So the idea that one should not put capital, not just money, but capital above human beings' health. This is something that is being said in many, many places, so that the strategic emancipatory plan is already there, which is pressure, because that's how, in fact, not elites, but corporate elites, my friend, and, and populists at the same time, with you know the ones who vote for Trump in in this country, for example, and also uh, it's so in New York City, as I said, since there is, I mean, the word socialism in this country, in the United States, is a word that immediately immediately discredits everything. Okay, it's a negative word, and also there is no serious left. I mean, I. I certainly like very much, I mean, I'm with the rethinking Marxism people. I'm myself, after all, a US Marxist, if you like, a Western Marxist. But within the, within the democratic possibilities, there is really no, this is a, supposedly a multi-party, no, two capitalist parties is what we have of certain, uh, slightly different uh, commitments. So therefore, I think in this country, it is, uh, it is, I think, impractical, even as I agree. I completely agree and I uh, try what I can as a teacher, as a general speaker, etc., without particularly saying, because I think 
it will be less than useful to do so, that this is a left project. Because it, how is it a left project anyway? The idea of, of it's, it's a general project. There is no left here. Left has to, has, to, has to go with everyone. It is a humanistic project. So the project that uh, capital should not be put above health, this is something that's being said all over the place. Second, strict and Angelina very much, man, very many thanks for putting this uh, thing in uh, place. You see, punishment is not my thing, obviously, but uh, I also understand I'm in a double bind there that when, in fact, as you see, the way in, again, I'm taking examples from my experience, the way in which the police are uh, dealing with so-called uh, the, uh, the breaking of the uh, distance, uh, social distance, uh, mask and glove rule, not glove, masks rule, with so-called, you know, the black folks, uh, etc. So Black Lives Matter come in there. It, and the way, for example, you know, I live, as I say, in a now gentrifying working class community. But nonetheless, 158th Street, if you know New York, you can walk down to the river. And I do walk down to the river for exercise. I'm 78 years old and I sit by the river and the police cars are there. But nice white guys, you know, running around and going on, but no mask. And upper class black guys, beautifully dressed, you know, no mask. Families, no mask. And the police don't do anything. I was going to say to Surya, I must find a way of saying this to the mayor that, you know, you should look at how this is done. So although I'm not really for punishment, I'm myself for rearranging desires so that people will want to do this. You know, I mutter, yeah. you know, as I go. I mean, old lady of color, I can't say too much, but I mutter, uh, be responsible, think of me, <laughs> you know, et cetera, like that. But yes, I, so I absolutely agree. But I will also say that the, uh, this, uh, maybe one of you have seen this because I'm not glued to the TV, but I saw all those pictures in Sweden about how they are trying to develop herd immunity and it's not quite working. But I didn't really yes. see any pictures of asylum seekers and migrants. And many, many years ago, many years ago, I wrote a thing. I gave it, in fact, in Lund. And, I, and in fact, my audience said that I was helped by Stefan Jonsson, who was then an editor uh, at Dagens Neuhete. And uh, I w uh, the Swedish audience said that it is shameful that the only person who gave a political speech is a foreigner, where I said that the so-called socialist wonderful polity was breaking down as it was, as the asylum seekers from Rwanda, etc., were coming in. I didn't see that at all anywhere. Maybe there is, I mean, I haven't seen everything. And I sh will also say, that the, the, as a result, this family values thing, right? Okay, we have to understand what's happening. Human behavior is now medicine. When my student Fuad Toshizi's father was dying in Iran and because of the United States sanctions, he couldn't go home. I was completely for him and I did what I could. But now not being able to visit your, your, uh, your uh, grandparents when they are in the thing, in the hospital, it's not the same thing. It's, as I say, human behavior is medicine now. So this so-called free choice in, you know, that's being touted. So free choice for what? Free choice for self-interest. So to an extent, uh, this second question, it's very, very important, although I cannot speak totally for punishment, <laughs> you know what I mean? But it may be a problem. It may be a personal problem. So, and the third one is, um, who, um, well, what was the, uh, the, the third question? I, my handwriting I can't read. What was the third question? Who you consider is the, who you consider is the subaltern in the, oh, the age of the global the pandemic? The subaltern, okay. See the subaltern. How far is the subaltern? <laughs> the, the subaltern, I only use one sentence which is uh, Gramsci's Notebook 25, because otherwise it becomes useless, which is small social groups, 
In other words, not constituted into a class anymore. That's in Marx. That's in the 18 Brumaire, when he talks about why uh, they could not represent themselves. Geltent, they couldn't, um, they, they were incapable of making themselves Geltent zu machen. That's, that's Marx in the thing. But they, so why? Because they are small social groups, writes Gramsci, on the margins of history. So therefore, they are not generalizable. Therefore, you cannot say that the folks that I work with are exactly comparable to the whatever the subaltern might be in Brazil. They're not primitive groups. You know, anthropology wants primitive groups. These subalterns are also within, they vote, which, uh, which is a very different thing. And yet, they're not generalizable. So what you do, and Monica, you actually mentioned it in one of your questions, the older questions. That, so what you do, subaltern is a position, that disposition, because they, they don't resemble, you can't have the whole, whole world, all subalterns come together. No, that's the problem with subalternity, that we do not have the infrastructure to hear them. They talk a lot. I didn't try to think all subaltern cannot talk. I wrote something, subaltern cannot speak. Their speech act cannot be completed because they speak, but we can't hear. That's the work I've been doing for the last 36 years and not succeeding because there's thousands of years of subalternization. So therefore I cannot tell you who is the subaltern because they are ungeneralizable. What we need to do is to see that they become, since they vote, and democracy is for other people, and yet they're poor as poor can be. How can you teach that intuition to the children of the very poor? I've been involved with this teaching now and for a very long time. I don't succeed, but it has to be done because it's the vote of the subaltern that creates a world inhabited and ruled by tyrants. They, in fact, quite unlike in the, in the past, in Gramsci's time, they hold our destiny in their hands. There is no way that I can tell you who is the subaltern in globality, because that's the whole thing. They're not generalizable. Subalternity must be destroyed again and again and again, so that they can be, they can claim citizenship. But believe me, they can't claim citizenship too easily, because if they do, they're punished. And they take the punishment because they have been convinced by centuries, persuaded by centuries of this kind of subalternization, that they are, that, that their wretchedness is normal, that they deserve to be where they are. You try working with the caste system and you will see. So therefore, I, that answer, that question, that's why I guess I wrote it in such a way that I couldn't read it. That onto phenomenological question, who is the subaltern in globality? If it could be ans answered, then they wouldn't be subalterns. Then they would be citizens. It's a very hard task. They're murdered for trying to claim their citizenship rights. It's very hard for them to, I could give you hundreds of examples because I work there. So, but at this is not the moment. Angelina will kill me. There will be a murder. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really loved your answer. And I think it is the best question and answer we can have for the, end of this uh, web interview. It is um, about time to wrap up. I would like though to give uh, also to Monica, but also you one, two minutes to say some conclusive remarks, something that you wish to be reminded after this web interview. Um, Monica, please. Okay. This is completely over my head. Uh, I think what I can say now is thank you. Thank you to the organizers and especially to Gayatri. I really enjoyed that and I learned a lot. And I think I have no conclusions. I go out with many, many questions. Um, and some of those questions have been here before and they are now a bit more precise, which I think is a form of intellectual progress. Some of them have not been here before, but I think they are important to think about. And yeah, I would just hope to, to kind of to have a possibility to continue this kind of conversation one way or the other. So just thank you. Surya, say one sentence. Surya, say one sentence. 
because you and I have done this together. Go. Yeah, we certainly have. Um, well, I'd like to thank the organizers, and I've just been paying attention to the chat as well. And it's, it's certainly been interesting to see all the com comments coming forth from all the, what, 1,500 participants or so. So it's been really terrific to see how many comments have come forth. And I will say also thank you. And like Monica, I have, I'm going back with questions that are very important for me. The, uh, I will say that the questions have been very, very instructive for me, but I will say that try to make the best use of the situation. Don't fall into just an unrestrained humanism. Please don't fall into just family values and sentimentalizing it in this way. Remember that human behavior is medicine in the current thing. Love nature and do strategize for, uh, for uh, against this kind of so-called normality. And do please do think about minorities as you've been doing. Remember the Rohingyas. Please remember what I said about the subaltern. And then I think I will just say thank you very much. And really thank you for your questions. And Monica, I can't tell you how interesting it was to receive the revised ones because I saw that we had had a dialogue after all. It was a wonderful thing. Thank you, Surya and Angelina. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Thank, Spivak. Thank, Thank you, Monica. You. Sorry. Thank you to the silent, silent moderator. Thank you to ah. the silent moderator. Okay, of Karen. course. Yes, of course. Thank you, Surya. Thank you, Barbara Steiner. She's the director of Transform Network and the person that was taking care of the chat and she was replying to all the questions that you had. Also, I would like to thank Heidi Ambrose. Uh, also part of our network, yes. Uh, yes. Gayatri and Monica knows her very well because all this was totally her idea. So I thank yes. her so, so much. Thank you very all time. who attended. <laughs> thank you all for attending this um, seminar. And uh, I would like to say that there were people from all over the world. I mean, at least the panel was from New York, Vienna, Athens. Um, we had so many different time zones, but also the participants come from all over the world. Thank you so much. Keep safe, organize, <laughs> and take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.